Our scripture for today is from Acts 28, 23 through 31, English Standard Version. When they appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he had said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying, Your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to his people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their hearts, and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. This is God's holy word. You may be seated. Thanks, Joshua. Church, for the last time, would you turn to the end of Acts here? Man, we've been in this thing since uh, September 18th last year, so 46 weeks. It has been really good, and I hope it has uh, been an encouragement you to just learn and see. Uh, I am going to cover a little bit looking back for those of you who might be guests or for those of you that have joined our church or fellowship since we've started this journey. It's our typical MO to preach through books. Most often you'll find us opening a book in God's Word, and we'll work verse by verse chapter by chapter, book by book, that maybe even someday, God willing, we'll have preached through the entire Bible. That would be something else to see. Um, The reason we do that, just by way of reminder, is we really believe as pastors and elders, it's the best way for long-term discipleship in a church. To just to have God's Word in your life, week in and week out, not avoiding hard passages, not avoiding or apologizing passages that we can struggle with theologically, not getting away from things that are hard or things that we have to see and wrestle with personally. But week by week, we come in here and we just let God's Word speak to us and shape us by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, as we um, look back, we started this journey with a, a series called The Church Begins. The Church Begins, you'll remember, covered the first six chapters. It was kind of the way that we saw Jesus ascend into heaven uh, at the very place where he'll touch back down when he comes to get his people. I find that pretty fascinating. The same thing, uh, same place he left right after he commissioned his disciples, the same place he's going to come back to uh, and get his people for the final judgment. There was this promise of one that was to come, uh, a Holy Spirit that would come and do in you what you couldn't do for yourself. And a Holy Spirit that not only would do the efficacious work of saving you, but he would be the same Holy Spirit that was going to sanctify you. That God said, listen, in and of yourself, you are not capable to do what my holy requirements require. I'm going to give you a helper. And he's not a helper that just comes alongside like buddy, buddy. He's the Holy Spirit of the Trinity that lives within you as you're a regenerated, converted believer in Jesus Christ, that's what you have is God himself and you as a seal and a sign to help you operate and live this life the way that you should. After Pentecost, when this church was born in a supernatural way, never to be replicated again, The Holy Spirit came and the spirit of tongues were on people so that they could proclaim the gospel in their own language so that many of the multi-nations that were there could hear. We see the church begin with 3,000 people. The first church was a mega church. And if you think that's too big, you're not going to like heaven because it'll be all of us in heaven. It'll be the biggest church. It will be the church with one chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, for all time. As that series came to an end when we saw the church begin, we see this first little um, kind of implementation of an office we know as the diaconate was the seedling form of that. These servants that were appointed, good and godly men, appointed for their character, appointed for their trustworthiness, but to take a specific need, to take a specific need in the church so that the elders could focus on the ministry of the word and praying, deacons were assigned there with widows and the distribution of food to do specific ministry so that the pastors and elders could work on the general ministry. Offices we still hold to, offices many churches still hold to, seeing those things started right there at the beginning. 
in uh, chapter 6. One of them, Stephen, becomes a martyr in chapter 7 when we began our church expand series. The promise came in Acts 1.8. That Jesus said, I'm going to do a work in you. You will be my witnesses, disciples, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That it's going to begin centrally in Jerusalem and like concentric rings just go out. The church would begin to expand and it started at the death, the death of Stephen. Stephen. And there was a guy there. We don't think he was actually a part of the one throwing stones onto Stephen. By his own admonition, he held the cloaks of those brothers of his that killed Stephen. And by implication, he was in the getaway car and helped with the murder. That guy was named Saul. So we saw this opposer then become very hostile to this expanding church. He tried to persecute them, put them in prison, and he caused much damage. We see Philip, God using an ordinary guy to do extraordinary ministry and helping an Ethiopian eunuch understand. And then he got to experience Star Trek like we see in the shows and the movies. He was teleported from one region 25 miles to the north. And it's there it seems from later verses in Acts that he became a pastor and raised up godly daughters to love Jesus. And we saw this church expand. Peter and James, the focal points of the church, tend to take a backstage. And then you see here ascending church in chapters 13 through 20. And it stars a guy that was the mortal enemy of Christians. Saul is converted to become Paul. Jesus has a personal experience with him on the Damascus Road and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you fighting my church? He's blinded, and then his eyes are opened. Spiritually, the same thing happens. He becomes a believer of Jesus Christ, and then he becomes not the great persecutor of the church, but the great promoter of the faith. Paul is there as this church sends now in Antioch, kind of the new Jerusalem, just sending out missionaries for three and a half years. He walks across the equivalent of the United States three and a half times, planting churches, proclaiming the gospel to Gentiles and Jews alike who don't uh, have any recollection of what Jerusalem's like except the word. He's out in foreign territory planting churches, and we see this church really, really begin to become a sending church. Finally, we see particularly Paul, but the church in general suffer. That's the series we've been in up until this point. That when you come to Christ, all of you comes. Not your intellect, and then you can have your emotions and your physical will, but it's all of you. It's your emotions, it's your mind, it's your intellect, it's your body, it's your will. You take care of this temple of God now because it's where the Holy Spirit dwells. But yet it's going to cause suffering to come at you and this residue of sin is still within you and you have to deal with it. And we see such an example in Paul. Trial after trial, Felix after Festus, King Agrippa and before Rome and Caesar, he suffers well. The guy was shipwrecked, snake bit, without sleep, hungry, and yet his perspective was totally shaped by the promise that he received from the Holy Spirit that he'd get to be a witness. And we were so encouraged last week when Hector helped all of us remember the promises of God that he's put on our life. All of us were greatly helped and shaped in our perspective based on what he preached in our example of Paul in the final two chapters. Now we get to Rome, and here's where we are. You know, as I was thinking about this, I did experience something this week that was um, a first for me. I experienced my first Atlanta sports heartbreak, (laughs) to which everybody here has responded, get used to it. So my son and I were graciously granted tickets to go to the playoff game, the soccer team, Atlanta United. And so we were hopeful. Uh, we had a really good team, had a, had a lot of momentum, going to have a rowdy Mercedes Benz behind us. And so we went to the game and it started off amazing. We scored in like the first six minutes and we're looking at each other. We're like, I think this is going to, we're going to do it again. So all our expectations kept building. Then we got a PK. And so it's like, woo. That penalty kick is a free shot at the goalie for these who don't know what soccer is, but it's a very exciting moment in sports. We miss that, and then we start to, to realize that potential is only potential until you use it. And then Toronto scores. And then they score again late in the game. And then we're sitting here desperate with the rest of the 60,000 plus in the stadium, hoping for one last ditch effort that we might tie this thing And wave after wave, cross after cross, attempt after attempt, the final whistle blows, to which we had super annoying Toronto fans in front of us, which doesn't help anything. 
Um, I had to pray out of the flesh multiple times. Um, but they start screaming, it's over, it's over. And I'm like, all right, buddy, let's beat the, let's, let's go. Let's walk fast and get to our car. But it was my first experience of, of like sports heartbreak where you believe and buy into a team and then they just leave you hanging. But it was a great conversation I was able to have with my boys say, listen, this doesn't define us. I don't have to have a miserable night or a miserable tomorrow because the team didn't win. We live to play again in sports. Sports do so many things to shape inside you and give you opportunity to grow as a person. I've always heard this. One coach told me this, and I've used it as a coach in all the environments. Sports don't define you. They reveal who you are. I think that's really good for a state that has identity problems with their sports. I'm just going to be honest, okay? That today, if you're a Gator, you're feeling down, maybe? If you're a, if you're a Bulldog, you're like, you're, you're telling me there's a CFP chance. We're going to be that one lost team. Listen, you could fill sports in for music, for job, for work, for money, for relationships in that same phrase. Your work doesn't define you. It reveals who you are. Your, your marriage doesn't define you. It reveals who you are. Your activities don't v- define you. They reveal who you are. And, and sometimes things end not the way we want. We're going to see acts end, and it's not going to be necessarily the way we want, but we're going to see something amazing in it, and we're going to hear the gospel in its most formal proclamation one last time. It's not the last proclamation Paul did. We see that from the last two verses. But it is the last formal attempt with Jews particularly in Rome. The big idea you're going to see here today is gospel people are going people. I'm going to tell you that again because if we're going to live out the gospel as we gather and go, guess who's gospel people? We are. Gospel people are going people. There's a final recording of Paul addressing. He's going to do some teaching, and that teaching ends up being divisive, and then we see now what, okay? That's where we're headed today. We're going to see how we're called to be going people, and we're going to see specifically what our going needs to look like. If we're going people, we need to look a certain way, and Paul's going to give us words and an example. Verses 17 through 22, we may not have to read every, every word there, but there's local leaders now as he's a Roman prisoner under house arrest. He's probably living pretty swanky under a governor or something, and people are able to come. He just can't leave the house. It's not like he has a bracelet on or anything on his ankle. He's just in the house under guards, but people can come and go freely. It was Christians that would take care of him and bring him food and different things. So people are coming. Local leaders of the Jews come, and they said, hey, let me just tell you what happened. And he walks through that whole legal thing we've been through. I did nothing wrong. They're all against me. I have my conscience is clear, but I'm here. And look what it says in verse 20. Because of the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain, I'm in prison willingly. I appealed to Caesar knowing what was happening. And I'm here because of the hope of Israel, which would pique their interest. And look what they said, verse 21. We have received no letters from Judea about you. And none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. I don't know who you are, and you keep telling me there's this problem, but we don't know about it. And then they say in verse 22, we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect that we know that everywhere is spoken against. The one thing they did know, that their Christianity was on the move, and it was was threatening their religious institution. It was threatening their bootstrap religion. It was threatening their personal pride of being attached to the historical God who said, these are my people, yet their lives really looked no different because of him. They were moral, but because they believed that it earned a relationship with God. They followed the laws that God never put in, but people did between the Testaments. They followed those to a T and judged people by it. So they were great religious bootstrappers. And when this idea of freedom that is being proclaimed, that your sin has eternal consequences, that you have to own that sin personally and know that your granny doesn't save you, your dad doesn't save you, your pastor doesn't save you, you are only saved by a good and gracious God. When that message starts resonating out, look what it says about them. It's spoken against. This religious institution wanted to earn their way to God earn his favor by how they lived. And the Christians were saying, I'm a mess. I'm my biggest problem. And God needs to do something that I can't do. And he's done it in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about Jesus. Not let me tell you what you should do. 
Now let me tell you how you should clean up your life and then you can come into synagogue. It's come just as you are, but know that God isn't going to keep you there in Christ. That's the message that gets spoken against. And now they want to hear what Paul has to say because there's some Jewish connection. Paul loves his Jewish brothers even despite their error in missing Jesus. Verse 23 when they had appointed a day for him, they came at his lodging in greater numbers. So this was like, dude, I'm going to go see Paul, and he's going to tell me about this hope. He's going to tell us about these crazy Christians. He says he's a Jew of Jews, but he's seen this guy named Jesus. I don't know, I've heard about him, but bro, you need to come. This personal invitation happened with the religious leaders, and now this governor's home's popping, and Paul's going to be teaching all day. Look what he does. This is not a casual three-minute elevator conversation about the gospel. This is not a lunch where you go in and you go out after about an hour, have your talk of small talk, uh, eat some appetizers, pay too much for a sandwich, and then bounce with a little bit of Jesus. Look how long this is. From morning till evening, he's going to do multiple things. He expounded to them. He explained to them. That means they were asking questions and there was dialogue and they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean about Genesis 3.15 that one is to come who will crush Satan? Satan will get a strike on him and he'll think he wins, but that heel that he struck will be the heel that crushes his head and evil will be done away with? Well, yeah, we, we know that person to be Jesus. In the first gospel, the solution for man's problem in Genesis was there all along. Yes, that's right. He's explaining to them. But he also says, look what God's done in my life. He testifies to the kingdom of God. That's an important phrase in your Bible. Anytime you see that, you need to underline it and know that it's about a concept that's bigger than a castle with a moat. We think of kingdoms and we think of guys in shining armor, princesses who are pretty, uh, court jesters who make us laugh, you know, big turkey legs that we eat and goblets we drink out of. It's not the kingdom we're talking about here. This kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. It's an already not yet thing, though, in Scripture because I read the news like you read the news. Are we perfectly sanctified and like seeing Jesus reign supremely in this earth right now? Spiritually, yes. We don't need to bring him back up on the cross. That work was done. But are there problems in the world today? Is there conflict or tension between government officials? Are there examples out there that are not the best in entertainment? Are there people who take college people away and see them hurt, maybe even killed, and then come to justice in the legal system? Yeah, that's still going. Yeah, I read the news too. Little ones, have you ever been hurt by a relationship in school? Has someone been mean to you before because they didn't know how to communicate, so they thought they would be mean and hurt you to make themselves feel better? Yes, this world's broken. So when we see kingdom of God, we know that it's already, but not yet. It's already here and established and is going forward, but it's not in its fullness yet. That will come at the end time. Paul's testifying about that. He's saying, I can tell you I was opposed to Christians. I was putting them in prison. I held the coats while my buddies killed Stephen. And guess what? The one who I was persecuting came after me. And I was under the rule of myself and my religious instruction and my moral bootstraps, and God obliterated that belief. And Jesus met me, and he called me. And when he saved me, he commissioned me to do something. So he's testifying about this kingdom of God. And look at this. I like this part. We're not very good at this as Christians. And, and when we think we are good at it, we're actually really bad at it. We make terrible examples in this part. And trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. We'll get to that last part first, but look at convince. We've seen that he's been expounding or explaining. He's testifying, saying, I've experienced this good work of God, and the kingdom is real, and the authority of God is real, and sin is real. He's been giving self-disclosure. He's testifying about it. And then trying to convince you know where we've gone wrong in evangelism? Tim Keller was right when he said it this way. He said, bad evangelism is this. I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm going to tell you about it. Think about that in your evangelism. Is that not the worldview most of us who are Christians come from? That lost, poor, less than person is wrong. I'm right. 
because I've been there every Sunday and I have the badge. And I got so many scriptures memorized. And my attendance is through the roof. And my moral life is way better than yours. I'm right. You're wrong. Let me tell you about it. That's where we've gone wrong. That's where we've gone wrong in evangelism. And when we're trying to convince people, we do want them to believe. Where does the convincing come from? Really? You may be smart. You may have a good apologetic. You may ask the right questions. But really, where does a dead person get convinced? From the life giver. From the one who raises the dead and opens blind eyes to see. That's not you and me, by the way. So our evangelism needs to move from, I'm right, you're wrong, let me tell you about it, to, boy, I was wrong, Jesus is right. Can I share with you what he's done? It's a total perspective changer when you're trying to just reach people. You realize you're no better than the person who's across the table from you. You're not better. Jesus is better. So if you're better, it's because of Jesus, not because of anything you did. I don't think that changed Paul's heart from wanting to see his Jewish brothers come to faith, but he knew where the change would come from. It would come from God alone. Now, the second thing we need to see very clearly here in our growing bibliology, we got to grow to believe the Bible. We don't try to poke holes in it. We have to come to say this Bible is God's revealed word and I believe in it. Everything, the hard stuff, the easy stuff, the good stuff, the Jesus stuff, all of it. I need to believe in it and come under it, not me over it. This is Paul's example. Look at, look at how he's doing this explaining, this testifying, and this convincing. What is his source? Both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Friends, that is called your Old Testament. Can I tell you something about this church if you're new? It's different than what some churches are declaring today. I want to, I want to be clear that way. There's a lot of churches who have the same commitment. We're not the only ones, okay? I want to tell you, Shadowbrook Church is a cover-to-cover -cover church. From cover to cover, we don't disregard any of it. We don't take any of it out because we don't like it, because it's too hard, because it's too weird to read. There's too many genealogies, because it's too ugly like the book of Judges. We don't take any of it out. From Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation, we are a cover-to-cover -cover people. Paul was actually a writer of the second part that we have here. He wrote most of your New Testament, along with the apostles and some other men who wrote things about Jesus. But at this point, what he knows is Genesis to Malachi. That's why it went on all day, from morning till evening. I mean, you want to sit down and explain to somebody the Old Testament, the story of it. Now, Jesus is the culmination. Jesus is the Messiah they should have been looking for. It's going to take some time. I can't do that to you in three to five minutes. I'm going to have to walk longly. I don't have to let you ask questions. I have to show you Scripture. But I want you to know we are resolute and firmly committed to being cover-to-cover -cover kind of people. I think gospel people who are going people are resolute to be cover-to-cover -cover people. Our hope doesn't come from within ourselves. It came from without ourselves, within ourselves, now through ourselves, unto the glory of God Himself. That's what we have to offer. Now, when we teach and explain and testify and try to convince, is everybody going to come to faith? How many of you have ever shared your faith and it ended miserably or they were opposed more to Jesus? Raise your hand. I know I have. Yeah, that's all of us. Boy, isn't that hard? You have this thing inside of you that you know you are convinced to the depths of your spirit that is right and true because God placed it in you. And then you're sharing that with that person, probably somebody you love even, and they go, eh, eh, that's good for you. They pat you on the head. I remember sharing with some people who I love who didn't want anything to do with the good news. I wasn't hostile. I wasn't uh, demeaning towards them. I shared all my flaws. And, and listen, Christians are the most hypocritical people on the planet. It's true. So if you've ever had an objection to Christianity because they're hypocrites, you're right. We are. We don't live perfectly. We have belief and hope and trust in the one who did. And so I want you to know, when you're discouraged through sharing your faith, welcome to the club. Look at Paul's results. Verse 24, some were convinced. <laughs> that means there was a party in heaven for those who believed, who were moral bootstrappers, who tasted the grace of God and said, man, I'm in for that. That sounds great. God did that in their life. 
But there were also some who didn't have that. Some were convinced, praise God, by what he said, but others disbelieved. Now, at this point, you have to know something. The Bible is right when it says to you and I, we were a part of two camps in this world history. The first camp we were all a part of, sons of disobedience, enemies of God, under the authority of Satan. So unless God comes and rescues you from that, that's the camp you're in. So these guys didn't do anything more than they're already doing disbelief. That is your MO to push against God, to push against grace. It is what's in your nature, as we'll find out later this spring, the sin that's inside you that opposes God and wants self-rule. So really the only change that happened was those who were convinced. God used the faithful proclamation, words, Words out of Paul's mouth as he expounded, testified, and tried to convince them to get them to believe. And this now has tension. There's two crowds that are opposed to one another. Verse 25, and disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. Listen, I've been in environments where you make one statement and people walk out. You make, we've been as leaders in situations where we've made one decision and finally someone said, that's enough for me, I'm out. That's what happened right here. What was this one statement? What was Paul going to say that caused people to go, you know what, peace out, see you later. I'm going to go, whatever I do, I'm out. It was this. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers, now stop right there. Does Paul have a, a, a bibliology and an author view of the Bible that he attributes to the Holy Spirit? He's talking about Moses. He's talking about the law and the prophets. He's talking about men that they would all respect who were authors of the Old Testament. Who does he attribute the authorship of what he's about to say to? The Holy Spirit. Paul had a big view of his Bible. He had a huge view of his Bible. It was the Holy Spirit writing through men, using their personalities, using their quirks, using their writing style, but it was the Holy Spirit who penned the Scriptures that we have before us. That's why I don't write in mine. You can write in yours. It's okay. I don't judge. I slightly judge you. Okay? Confe I can't. I got to be real. I can't, I can't deny that. But you can't. My wife does. It's great. I love looking through her Bible through the years because it's like... I mean, everywhere. And then she dates things, and then we look back and read it about when God did something at that time when we were struggling with this thing, and then we look at our life and we go, that's amazing. And she can do it. And it's an open-handed issue, right? But I don't because I'm my weird personal type A over-controlling personality, okay? But the Holy Spirit gave us this. These are God's words. The Holy Spirit was right in saying, what does he say there in your Bible? Look, the Holy Spirit was right in saying to who? What's your Bible say? Your fathers. What changed right here? I mean, it's as if in the moment you've watched Paul be patient with his Jewish brothers over and over and over, and then something changes. They call him the apostle to the Gentiles. It's not because he didn't go to the Jews first. He did. Our gospel went to the Jews first. They rejected it, and then it went to the Gentiles. But it's as if here in the movie that we've been watching, as this series closes out, Paul switches. And you don't hear him call them brothers. You don't hear him call them friends. It's as if he gets stronger. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. Now he's going to quote Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. He's going to go back and use a piece of history to show what's happening now more fully in Jesus in the ministry of the gospel. You have to know a little bit about Isaiah for this to make sense. Isaiah was a prophet who couldn't open his mouth and speak until God made him able to by touching his lips with a coal. You know that story, right? Who woe is me? I'm unworthy. I can't do anything. I'm a man of unclean lips. Coal touches and then he goes, blah, with a lots of prophecy. Chapters 1 through 5 in Isaiah are the summary of the whole book. Chapter 6 is the climax, and then chapter 7, the rest of the way, just shows the results of his prophecy being fulfilled and people rejecting God. Assyria is on the horizon. They've already obliterated the northern kingdom. Jerusalem and Judea are left, but they have an opportunity to hear to believe and trust in God to provide instead of just going, ah, eh, what's going to happen? 
And there's this crazy story there of this King Hezekiah who makes a terrible mistake that I'm so fearful of. I just turned 41. I think I got half my life yet if physically we make it. And I don't want to be Hezekiah when I grow up. I don't want to be Hezekiah who knew the Assyrians were coming, saw them on the outskirts, and he looked around to his team and his people and his crowd, and he said, you know what? At least there'll be peace in my day. And he didn't make plans or provisions to see the people of God stay under the rule of God in the place of God, and they went into captivity for it. It's a great downfall of generations as they grow old in churches and homes and workplaces when they go, you know what? At least it'll be good for me. I, I, I can tell you something. This is not confession time. This is just honest motivation time. I love family first. I love squiggly, squirmy little kids that ask questions out loud sometimes to their parents. I love that the gospel being sung is going into their ears. That even though they may not be paying attention fully right now, the words are over them and could be penetrating their heart. And I want to give the next 40, 50 years, if God will give me, to make sure that there is a church still here for them. We are committed as leaders, as one author said, to plant churches of whom we may never, or plant trees of whom we may never sit under their shade. I want to plant churches too. I want to send out the DNA of, of gospel living here and see that happen. But I want you to know, if you're a guest here at Consistency, we are going to work hard to reach kids and students, to see them grow up with sound theology, committed believers, cover to cover. As a world keeps being hostile, they say, you know what? It doesn't matter. I'll begin. I'll expand. I'll suffer well. I'll be a sender too. I'm going to be that kind of Christian that gives my whole life to God. That's what we're committed to. And we're asking you to come along the way to be a part of that same mission. It's not because they're more important than you. It's just our focus. We have to create that which will be sustainable for those who will go after us. What usually gets tolerated usually gets embraced. What gets embraced then will become celebrated in culture. So I want to make sure that the gospel is not assumed for this generation, but it's embraced. And I'm so excited about what I hear in some of the youth and some of our young people in our colleges, college age and what they're doing. I just want to see it flourish. I want to see everyone flourish from birth to grave. I want to see you in your most kind, in your most tenderhearted, your most Christ-like in your final days. I don't want to see you bitter and embattled and upset and questioning and frustrated. Those are things we're all going to battle as we get older. But I want to see you more like Christ, more committed to welcoming and training the younger, to let them learn from your wounds and being honest about the mistakes and having a disposition about you when you finish that people go, that guy loved Jesus. That gal loved Jesus. I don't want to have a funeral for you where everybody doesn't want to look anybody in the eye because it's just awkward. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for any of us. I want to be committed over time, cover to cover, to letting Christ do a good work. Now back to Isaiah. Side note there. What was it in Isaiah that the God had called him to go tell the people? It was this. 26. Go to this people, Isaiah, and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes as they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with ears and understand with their heart. He uses three organs, three senses, three parts of who we are to say, go tell these people, you're not going to see God, you're not going to hear God, you're not going to believe God. And for that reason, God's going to move. See, the sight is what we experience first. Maybe sound too. But if you have a vision and it's not growing dull, you see things first and then you hear with words things that are happening. That's how things mostly get into you. There is a part of you called your heart, which the Bible speaks to, where understanding, where belief, where trust happens. It's not your physical fleshly heart. It's representative of that causal core, that deepest part of who you are that believes and trusts in something. And morally speaking, it's the part of you that's dead because of the fall. So he's saying to these people, you're going to hear, but you're not going to understand. You're going to see, but you won't perceive because he's made them deaf and he's made them blind. We know that from Matthew and from Romans and from John. 
The heart, people's heart has grown dull. The ears they can barely hear, their eyes they have closed. You almost see a, a walking away and a hardening and a closing to have nothing to do with God. Do you think that's indicative of anything we're experiencing in our Western American culture today? Eyes that have seen but go, mm. ears that have heard that, that go, what? And hearts that are getting calloused. They don't understand. But if they would, in turn, and I would heal them, verse 27. He wants people to see with their eyes, to hear with their ears, and to understand with their heart. And he would heal them. He would heal their land. He would heal the oppression. Spiritually, taking it to 30,000 feet and even higher for us, he wants your spiritual eyes, which are blinded to sin, to be opened. He wants your spiritual ears, which are hardened to the gospel, who don't want to do anything with Jesus, to be opened and hear clearly the message of salvation. And what he wants is this, to understand at the deepest part of who you are, that you are your worst problem and you're an enemy of God outside of his intervention. He doesn't leave the message there. That's not the way this ends. He would heal them. And then look at 28. This is so hopeful. Therefore, let it be known to you. This is now Paul addressing them again. That this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He tells this room that's now divided. Some have been convinced. Some disbelieve and continue in their disbelief. And he says, because of this, what you know in your Bible, the Gentiles will listen. Whose salvation is it? Whose salvation is it in verse 25? Let it be known to you that this salvation of God, it is God's salvation in your life. It's not yours. Your experience in embracing and believing by faith is secondary to the salvation he puts on those whom he saves. It's been sent to the Gentiles because they'll listen. Because they'll listen. I find that deeply encouraging. But that's the last thing you really hear from Paul, formally, in what he said. We'll get on to what he says in verse 30, but think about this. How in the world are we supposed to take Isaiah and this prophet where he said, ears, eyes, heart, it's all a mess, and you've grown hard and you've grown callous, you're not going to believe. How are we supposed to be going people, gospel people that are going people in light of this? Well, I'll tell you this. Number one, they need to see Jesus in our life. People need to experience your life in such a way that when they look at you, they go, huh, huh. That you open the door for someone. It could be as simple as that. That uh, I, I love the little meet and greet time we did. I went up to one of our little ones in here. I said, hey, welcome to Shadowbrook. Good to see you. And the mom was like, show them your firm handshake. You know, because all of us as men go to that passive thing of we just put wet noodles and limp fish out there. Hi. Man, as a, you, you shake your hand. And when you look at people, you look them in their eyeball to show them value and dignity and respect. And you learn to say thank you. Yes, sir. No, sir. And you respect the generation above you. And you learn to tolerate with grace the rebellious generation below you. Right? It can start at work when you're, when you're given this opportunity to say, hey, you know what? Just turn in the receipts this way. It'll be good. Nobody has to know. That you go, no, I can't do that. Because the price of my integrity isn't worth making our profit sheets go up at the end of this quarter. And they go, huh. It's, it's in a marriage when, when, when couples are fighting and missed expectations and there's no communication that they both stop and go, you are not my enemy and I made a commitment to you beyond myself and how I'm feeling. I want to love you and care for you and, and communicate with you well. So I'm going to slow down and try to listen to you. And the spouse goes, huh. The guy that's uh, addicted to this, addicted to that, that transforms and gets cleaned up by the power of the Holy Spirit and what he does, that he goes to work and people, and people go, Yeah, you know, I want to. I want to be in a city where we where people talk about the Shadowbrook people, the Shadowbrook Christians. and go, gosh, they're just so darn nice. Man, they love Jesus. They'll care for you even when you don't deserve it. Hey, get those people on your volunteer team. They'll work hard. They'll show up on time. They'll do the job to the fullest. They won't cut corners. They'll believe in you and support you even if they don't have their name on anything. They're amazing people. And 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 you know what city workers and people do when we do that? They go, huh. We need to live out the gospel. We need to be a going people by helping people see Jesus with our life. 
We also know that that old axiom, that platitude that says, hey, share the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words, it's bogus. It's wrong. Sharing the gospel always will lead to using words. So we need to let them hear the good news from our lips. Do you know the most primary, ordinary, God-ordained way that people become Christians? One person proclaiming the gospel to another person and God going, life. It's not me running around with a hanky and patting myself and throwing my arms around saying, feel it, feel it. It's not that. It's not me asking you to get in the water and go, here, you're going to be saved in this lukewarm water. It's not that. Has God done extraordinary things through history? Yes. Does he still do extraordinary things, especially in persecuted places, to see people come to faith? Yes. You know what he does with us? Hey, can I tell you the hope I've had? I was a miserable, wretched, depraved, sinful person and broken, and God was kind and gracious to me because of Jesus Christ. I had a sin problem that needed to be dealt with, and I couldn't deal with it on my own, but God did in Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, who died a necessary death that atoned for that sin and proved he could conquer them by walking out of the grave in the resurrection. And I just want you to know that that's the hope I have, and I love you because of who you are in God, and I want you to know that. And that person goes, I want to believe. That sounds awesome. I accept responsibility. I believe by faith and I I believe by faith and I repent of those things. I want to believe. That's the most ordinary way that God saves people. The most normative way is from one person sharing the gospel with their lips to another person and watching God do something amazing. People need to hear the good news from our lips. And finally, we need to call them at a heart level to believe. We need to have the courage and the faith to ask people in those moments, do you believe? Do you want to believe in Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man who came to take away and deal with finally the sin of the world, your sin, my sin, and he is savior of your life when you believe over everything, your mind, your will, your intellect, your body, he's over everything. Do you want to believe in that? That's what Paul asked of these people and some people did and some people didn't. The results are not up to us. Since the power is not up to us, the pressure is off us. The responsibility to share is what's commanded of us, though. We need to show people with our life so they can see it. We need to say the gospel so they can hear it. And we need to call them at a heart level to believe. That's what Paul said. And then he finishes out by this. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came in, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that. He's evangelizing and discipling, proclaiming the kingdom of God. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Oh, you believe? Let me teach you about what, you do, what God just stepped you into. Let me teach you about the redemptive story. Let me teach you about the scriptures. Repent and believe. This is the great commission right here, Matthew 28. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching, the Lord, uh, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptizing people by reaching them and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. Isn't that funny how Scripture works together? It doesn't contradict itself. I find that amazing. And he did this with all boldness and without hindrance. And that's where your book ends. And I don't know about you. Maybe it was the heartbreak of the soccer game, but I read that and I go, is that it? I mean, Acts is Luke 2. Luke is the gospel of Jesus. Acts is then Luke's account of what the Holy Spirit did through the apostles to see the church begin, see the church uh, expand, see the church sin, see the church suffer well. And then it ends like this. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the story's not done yet, people. That statement in Isaiah that Isaiah made after he saw the vision of God was made in 776 B.C. Do the math. I did it. I may be right. I may be wrong. But don't judge me on it. Don't send me an email. That's 2,776 years ago. That Isaiah made a prophet to a particular people in Jerusalem that was going to be ultimately filled in Jesus and Paul in saying that the salvation went to the Gentiles like it was always planned to. So guess what? That's you and me. The seeds of what we see here, the seeds of what was said in Isaiah 2,700 years ago, 2,000 years ago, we're here now because God makes good on his promises. That's unbelievable. I teach you to be patient with what God's doing in your life, won't it? He's not going to finish writing the story until John 10 is fulfilled when Jesus said, the sheep hear my voice 
and they know my name, and they're going to come to me, and all the sheep I call by name will come. So guess what we're in in this final dispensation of church history? Letting people see the gospel in our lives. Letting people hear the gospel from our lips. And calling people to believe the gospel at a heart level. One commentator said it better than I could in finishing out an entire book. Let's hear from him. Luke's conclusion of Acts brings the book to a climactic end, leaving us exactly where the Holy Spirit wants us. Ready for the next chapter. That chapter continues to be written today. The gospel still advances to the ends of the earth and God has called all his people to live as protagonists in this glorious chapter. Luke ends his narrative with an implied question. Peter preached the kingdom in Jerusalem. Philip proclaimed Christ in Samaria. Paul announced Christ around the Roman Empire. Where will you go? Will the church today fail in its divine mandate or will we, like the Apostle Paul, march forward in faith with zeal for God and hold on to his promises? We face a task unfinished. May God grant us the strength and courage to stand in that long line of spirit-empowered, faithful witnesses which stretches all the way back to that unlikely band of first-century pioneers, those men and women who, filled with God's Spirit, did indeed turn the world upside down. That's the book of Acts. That's your story. It's my story. It's the gospel. Do you believe? Let's pray. Father, would you grant us the kindness of repentance? Father, the work you're doing in our lives is a steady, ordained, sovereignly controlled thing. Help us trust in that. God, if there are some here, even today, who have been dead to sin and now awakened to life through gospel proclamation, I pray they believe. I pray they have the courage to talk to the person who brought them. Talk to you about it. Confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord and then they will be saved. So God, thank you for 46 weeks. Faithful men in this series who have proclaimed the word a great team of preachers at this church, a God-glorifying, humble people who are making a difference in showing Jesus with their lives and communicating Him on their lips and calling a lost world to believe, a lost world which they were once part of, but you chose to bring them out. Your salvation did indeed go to the Gentiles, and we're grateful for that. So God, as we continue now to sing the Bible and continue in our worship, help us hear the story. Help us see the story. Help us believe the story and this truth that you indeed are the King of Kings. For we pray in the King of Kings' name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.